Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Radical Candor podcast. I'm Kim Scott, author of Radical Candor and co-founder of the company, also Radical Candor. And I'm Jason Rosoff, CEO and co-founder of Radical Candor. And I'm Amy Sandler, your host for the podcast, Radical Candor, how to kick ass at work without losing your humanity. Today, we're talking about a subject that's near and dear to our hearts, which is that radical candor is not brutal honesty, or what we call in the radical candor framework, obnoxious aggression. One of the most painful things that has happened to me since the book came out is we'll be working together with a team and we're sort of helping people roll out the ideas of radical candor and we'll walk into a room and somebody will charge in and say, in the spirit of radical candor, and then they will proceed to act like a garden variety jerk. And this is not the spirit of radical candor. Uh, and yet this happens all the time. In fact, HBO's uh, Silicon Valley, the, the TV show, did kind of a spoof on radical candor. And there was this COO in the show uh, who was really acting like a complete asshole uh, and calling it radical candor. So when I saw that, it, it was, I mean, it sold a lot of books. So I wasn't that sad about it <laughs> on the one hand. But on the other hand, I was very sad about it because that's not the spirit of radical candor. This is something I've given a lot of thought to since since the book has come out. How to really think through explaining to people the difference between radical candor and obnoxious aggression. In fact, it's part of what prompted me to write the second edition of the book, where I offer mm -hmm. people a new framework, compassionate candor. It's really interesting, even when we are in workshops and we explain the idea of calling it compassionate candor, how some light bulbs go off, and also an awareness that would a book called Compassionate Candor have been as successful as a book called Radical Candor? <laughs> yeah, almost probably not. In fact, especially one written by a woman. I think it would have been easier if I were a man to get away with calling it Compassionate Candor. Mm -hmm. it, it makes me think when I started Juice, this software company that I write a lot about in the book and where I learned a lot of hard, hard lessons about management, someone said to me, something along the lines of, Kim, this is so interesting. You hate the man, and now you are the man, <laughs> because I was CEO of the company. Uh, I think that that has a lot to do with thinking about how to be radically candid in the truly radic radically candid sense of the in the compassionately candid sense of the word, because very often part of the problem here is being unaware of power you have. And very often when you have power in a situation, you can come off as obnoxiously aggressive uh, when, when your intentions are not at all to be a jerk. Jason, what have you noticed either for yourself or even with folks that you've worked with about the relationship between power and obnoxious aggression? Well, I, I think there's, there's a subtlety here because I, I think it, it is quite common for the, the pattern of I'm a, I'm a leader in this organization and I really want to be able to offer radical candor to all of my underlings. And every time I do, they get they get annoyed with me because that, they say I'm acting like a jerk, but I'm just being radically candid. Like that is a pattern that we see repeat itself mm -hmm. over and over again. And, and so it, it's worth taking that moment to explore, like, why might it be coming across that way? And I think in many cases, there's a simple reason why it comes across that way, because the power that is inherent in that person's position makes the critique seem as though it is a career upending issue, uh, right? Which is like the CEO noticed me doing something wrong. That probably means I'm going to get fired. And so because that is likely to happen, because there's a likely there's a high degree of social threat inherent in a critique coming from someone with power to someone without power there is often that perception. And the antidote we, we say is like, you need to take the time to actually demonstrate that you care, that, that mm -hmm. this is coming from a place of care. And there are some leaders who do this with real grace too, like who you know have ways of helping people see like, I'm not telling you this because I don't believe in you. I'm telling you this exactly because I do believe in you. <laughs> like, because I, I know 
that you can do better. And so it's been really interesting to see those conversations play out. Like often as a facilitator, I found myself not even having to say much well, as two leaders in the room sort of talk to each other about their experiences of one another's feedback. <laughs> um, because often the person who's saying, I'm really good at radical candor, just everybody misinterprets me. It's not only in those relationships where the power dynamic is big, it's even in those relationships where those where people might consider them a peer. And so there's this pattern of behavior that emerges. I think another thing that happens is that we talk a lot about how important it is for radical candor to be a conversation and not a monologue. And if one person has too much power, the other person doesn't dare speak back. And if you feel that it is dangerous to correct, I mean, because we say, you know, you got to be humble when you offer radical candor, you may be wrong. You may be wrong about what you're saying. But it may be difficult for the person to tell you that you're wrong. And so if it feels unsafe to correct the radical candor, to say, actually, uh, that was not a mistake I made. I did it for this, this, and this reason, and I did the right thing, not the wrong thing. If the person who you're talking to doesn't feel free to disagree with you, and they won't feel free to disagree with you if you have the power to fire them, then you need to figure out what you can do to lay that power down in order to have a truly radically candid conversation. What's interesting and what you're sharing, both you and Jason, is something that I've noticed and Kim, you've spoken to recently, which is as companies grow from kind of a small startup where there's maybe some co-founders or people that know each other well and have a really shorthand way of communicating what might be radically candid between them. And then as it scales that shorthand way of communicating is going to land very different. And so some of the things that I've noticed in workshops, Jason, to your point of people are having a conversation between the two of us, and that might be the way those two communicate, but how it lands for people that are a few layers down, not in that room can land as very obnoxiously aggressive. I don't know if that's something you've noticed as companies grow, that what worked in a smaller group can actually, once it goes out, multiple layers can land in a very different way. I noticed that personally, when I was in product, I had a person um, in engineering who was, I worked with at two different companies for nine years in total. And over that time, we developed a very shorthand way of communicating with each other. And we were very comfortable disagreeing with one another and vigorously disagreeing with one another. Uh, And I remember uh, it was a short time into our uh, our time together at Khan Academy, which my the last company I was a part of, and and someone made this offhanded comment of like, oh, it makes us it, ma- it makes us nervous when when uh, mom and dad are fighting, and I was like, oh, that's really interesting, like because like I don't even see it as a I don't see it as a fight. I don't feel like with, there's there's like um, there's tension, but there's not there's not anger, you know, there's not like there, there's not animus. But it made me reflect on it. And then a few weeks later, uh, we were having another one of our animated conversations on the street. We were actually pulled over by the Mountain View Police Department. And we were asked (laughs) if we were okay um, because it looked like we were going to punch each other in the face. And at that point, I think we both realized that there there was an issue with the way that we were communicating with each other that was not translating. Forget several layers. Like even the casual observer was having a hard time understanding that there was care there. We've had disagreements with Jason, but we've never, I've never experienced experience. It's very interesting that this is possible from you, actually. I would like to see it. I I actually think part of the reason why I'm telling this story is because this was like a a bit of a watershed moment for me and realizing the impact of my behavior and how scrutinized I was as a leader. Because Amy, exactly to your point, like something that Ben and I were very comfortable with and had no negative impact on our relationship whatsoever gave other people the impression that it had a negative impact. And so I started to understand my behavior through that lens of like, other people are looking to me um, as a role model. And most of the people in that room did not have at that point, a seven year relationship with everyone else that they were working with. And so I had to be conscious of the behavior that I was demonstrating. And that led to over time, an awareness. I, I enjoy a good argument and my awareness of that like debate actually is in a comfortable place for everybody, especially like an animated or, or sort of like, you know, where emotion, like emotion becomes a part of the debate is not comfortable for everybody and the silencing effect that that was having. And so part of the reason you don't see it is because I got that feedback and I started to, to work on that behavior. It's interesting because I had kind of a similar situation. I think I'd tell this story in the book, in fact, where 
there was a guy who had worked for me for a long time, and we had a similar kind of relationship. We were internationalizing AdSense, and this guy kept confusing Slovakia and Slovenia, which are two very different countries, and I happen to have spent time in the region, so I was very aware of this. And I corrected him once, I corrected him twice, and then the third time he did it, I was like, it's Slovakia, dumbass, not Slovenia. <laughs> <laughs> which was not the nicest that like that was obnoxious aggression except in the context of our relationship mm -hmm. there was a shorthand and he understood he knew that I cared he knew that I respected him he knew this was just my way of getting his attention uh but not everybody else in the room knew that everybody kind of looked at me like I was you know so so you do have to be aware that other people may not have the context of your relationship. And then they might be af afraid to make a mistake because they don't want to get called dumbass. Oh, yes. yeah, uh, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's tricky because you want to have natural, authentic relationships, but you need to be aware that those naturally authentic relationships sometimes need to happen in private. This is one of the problems with like radical transparency. There are aspects of relationships that do need to happen in, in private, not necessarily in public. You know, we talk a lot about radical candor is measured not at the speaker's mouth, but at the listener's ear. And that makes a lot of sense when it's one to one. But when it's one to one plus a few other people in the room and how is it landing? I mean, I was doing a workshop overseas where it, there was some humor between two people that landed very inappropriately for some of the other people in the room who are brand new. And so it was very, so I think the same thing happens with humor where there's a shared understanding of what a joke is. Um, but when it is extrapolated to other people that aren't in on that joke, it can sound actually quite offensive. Humor is particularly tricky because very often humor when it's at its best is a way it's ha 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 it can reveal something. But very often we use humor to bury something that needs to be revealed. And like, I think when someone tells you something that you meant is funny, is offensive, pay attention. Uh, don't say, oh, it was just a joke. Because we do often misuse humor to, to justify expressing something that's biased or racist or sexist. There was one other thing on my mind, which is, what happens when someone like fails in humility and how how connected that that is to like this radical candor becomes obnoxious aggression thing and you know we say in the framework and you know Kim you spent a lot of time talking about this in the book too of just like we need to be aware of like the capital T truth and sometimes the this this like obnoxious aggression radical candor the, the thing that ticks us over into obnoxious aggression is when we assume that not only do we know exactly what happened, do we know the truth of the facts of the matter, but we know the motivations behind it, or that we know the solution, that we know the answer, like, uh, and how to fix it. And that's the other place where I, I think there's like contradictory information in the world, because often people say like, don't give feedback unless you're willing to help the other person solve the problem. And so People assume that that means you give the feedback and then you immediately give the solution to the, to the problem. Yeah. And you um, may not know the solution, but that doesn't mean it's not helpful to give the feedback. Correct. And so like the, this idea of like often when we're trying to help in these situations, it's very easy for that to come across as sort of like pedantic or, or even belittling or, or arrogant. And why it's so important to like give some airtime to like actually talk about the feedback itself before you go into problem solving to say like, to stop at, you know, this is my perspective. Like, do you agree? Do you share, do you experience this in the same way? Am I on my own here? Like to check that first, because if someone doesn't agree with the, the premise and you immediately shift in solutions, now you've got two problems that you need to like fix because the person is, still has does not feel heard or understood in the first place and in the second place there you're having an argument about the solution to a problem that you don't even agree on which is a waste of time and often comes across as obnoxious in fact it is obnoxious it is obnoxious that's a good <laughs> point it's really obnoxious i'll even say i'll just state it it is it is obnoxious for me to say you know i know the truth and and let me tell you what the truth is we were having some work done on our house and one of the contractors was just reaming out one of the people working on the house. And, and I kind of went over there to make sure everything was fine. And 
he said to me after, you know, I read your book and this is like this. And I was like, oh, no, <laughs> it really that, is. The ho- it that, is the house of radical it is candor. The house of radical candor. And I was like, that that's not really what I was suggesting um, that you do. I mean, he was talking to this guy as though he was his father, as though he were an abusive parent that is the only thing I can say. He was like, let me tell you how the world works and how you have to adjust it. You know, like once again, one of those painful moments where I was like, gosh, you know, my my suggestions have been badly misunderstood here. So so I hope one of the things that that we can do with this podcast and that I'll do with the next book is like tell people not only how to solicit radical candor and how to give radical candor, but how to respond to obnoxious aggression, to bullying behavior in a, in a way that can move a situation towards radical candor. Because if we, if we can't do that, then we're not going to get to a place of radical candor. So Kim, one of the things when the book originally came out and was shared was this idea that, you know, radical candor is optimum. And if there's anything that's second best, it's obnoxious aggression, not because obnoxious aggression is good, but because at least the person is aware of the mistake that they're making. Whereas the other two quadrants, ruinous empathy and manipulative insincerity, you don't actually know what the issue is. So you at least know that there's a problem, but at the cost of the relationship. So I wonder as you're reconsidering or looking at some of the ways in which radical candor was weaponized or misinterpreted, do you still feel that way that obnoxious aggression is kind of second best or do you have, do you want to revisit that, that idea? So the, the thing about obnoxious aggression is that it actually works better than ruinous empathy. And so I think part of the reason why there's this false dichotomy in the world is that people think they have to choose between ruinous empathy and obnoxious aggression. And if they have to make that choice, they're going to choose obnoxious aggression because it actually works better. Uh, my real goal is not to do any of the bad stuff, to do the good stuff. <laughs> uh, but, but I do want to acknowledge that it is, it is very true. What happens often as companies evolve, but we, we've worked with a bunch of fast growing startups. And they start out pretty radically candid, a small group of people. They all care a lot about each other. And, uh, and they're all very clear with one another when things aren't working. And, and that clarity is part of their success. And their success helps them grow. And as they grow, they get more people. And it's harder to be radically candid with people you don't know well. And sometimes, as we were just talking about, what is radical candor between two people gets misinterpreted as obnoxious aggression by third parties. And people tend to drift towards ruinous empathy as, as groups get larger. As you grow from 10 to 100 to 400 people, uh, there's a natural drift towards ruinous empathy because you don't want to hurt people's feelings. There's this sort of idea that I'll just get to know people. And then as I get to know them, then I'll be radically, you know, it's a justification for not offering. It's a rationalization for not offering the radical candor. And the problem with ruinous empathy, in addition to the fact that it doesn't help people grow, is that it doesn't work. You start to make mistakes. Mistakes get uncorrected. It hurts not only your relationships, but also your business results. And so the people who are obnoxiously aggressive uh, have an advantage. And there's a stage in the growth of every company, which is a very dangerous stage. It's the stage when the assholes begin to win. <laughs> and all of a sudden, the people who are obnoxiously aggressive, they get promoted. And the people who are ruinously empathetic or Sometimes the manipulatively insincere people get promoted too, but that is a problem because when everyone in a, when, when the leaders in a company are obnoxiously aggressive, behave like jerks, it is natural for the people, especially the people who, who work for them to respond with manipulative insincerity. They don't dare challenge the bad behavior. So the bad behavior continues. And then mistakes, not only do mistakes get made, made, but relationships really sour. That's how toxic work environments develop is the assholes on top and the rest of the company responding with manipulative insincerity. It's really important, really important as companies grow to learn how to challenge obnoxious aggression. 
with rat, not by becoming yourself obnoxiously aggressive, but with radical candor. Do either of you have an example if for someone that's listening that might find themselves in an organization like that, that actually works to, especially if it's upwards, if you see your boss is moving into that obnoxious aggression zone, what's one possible path? So in my experience, when someone is bullying you, and that's kind of what obnoxious aggression mm-hmm. is, it's a, it's a form of bullying, the only thing that really works is some consequences for that bullying. And if, if that person has positional authority over you, it's very hard to figure out how to create consequences. So I think a simple way to think about it is a use statement, like s- simply saying, if you feel comfortable, you can't talk to me like that is actually very reassuring for that other person <laughs> often. It works surprisingly well. Or if that feels uncomfortable for you, even just asking a question, what's going on for you here? But putting the onus on the other person to just sort of putting the spotlight on the other person. Uh, I was I was talking to my daughter about this when she was getting bullied at school. And I was giving her this advice like, oh, maybe if you just tell that person how they're making you feel. And she looked at me and she was like, mom, he's trying to hurt my feelings. Why am I? It's like giving him a cookie to tell him he succeeded in hurting my feelings. This is when you, you want to sort of say, look, you can't talk to me that way. You want to create some kind of consequence for that other person. Ideally, you work in a place where there's a, a clear path to escalation and where there's checks and balances on power. This is one of the reasons why Google, I think, was, especially in the early days, a great place to work. If your boss was a jerk, you could switch teams. You didn't even have to talk to your boss. And uh, and so that created some checks and balances on on bad boss behavior. There was very explicit sense there that nobody should have to pay the asshole tax. Mm-hmm. I remember a concrete example of um, I, I was working in product of, and we had uh, a leader, uh, an executive in the organization who would often come into meetings um, unprepared and then like give an uninformed decision, like a perspective on a whole bunch of stuff and expect that everybody would just sort of listen to what they, what they were saying. And then it would, would leave. We, we kindly referred to it as the swoop and poop. Um, <laughs> the seagull manager. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> seagull management. They fly over, they like, crap all over everything and then they fly away. Right? And then they fly away. Exactly. And it was like, <laughs> it was, not only was it obnoxious, like the, a lot of expertise in that room that had led to the decisions that we had and sort of ignored, ignored that expertise. And that came across as a lack of care. And so the feedback landed squarely in obnoxious aggression, but it often had a series of unintended consequences because like it, it would take a long time to clean up after that meeting to figure out exactly like, like what to do. And, and I remember going into this executive's office afterwards and being like, you know, when you do this, we spend hours, days and weeks actually cleaning up from these meetings. And I'm not sure if you intend for us to be spinning our wheels for days after each of these sessions, but that's what's happening. Um, we need to find a way to get your feedback into this process that doesn't cause such a massive disruption. I didn't know it at the time. I wasn't being disrespectful, but I was using the you statement version of the feedback of like, you do this. This is the effect. It's not about feelings. I didn't focus on the fact that because it was hurting people's feelings also. But I did focus on the fact that this is interrupting the work, the thing you're theoretically there to help with. Yeah, it causes harm. I think that's yes. so important is to focus on the harm that this kind of behavior does, because usually when someone is in an obnoxious aggression mode, they really don't care that they hurt your feelings. Correct. Yeah. And, and, I, and I knew that they did care about the work. They did care about us getting the work done and getting it done in a timely way. I did do some internal focusing on them. But when I presented it, it wasn't about my hurt feelings or the team's hurt feelings. It was just like, no, like this is this is getting in the, in the way of the work. It's causing harm. And I think after there was some recognition, we also got to have a conversation about the other type of harm that it was causing, which was the sort of like reputational or, or relational harm that it was causing. Because, you know, the other thing that was becoming true is like no one wanted this person's feedback. 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this person, this person is getting, you know, everybody is proactively ignoring that's manipulative and sincerity. They're ignoring what that per like, do you want to be the kind of leader who everyone tries real hard to ignore? Like not yeah. most people don't want to be that leader. <laughs> and yet they often become that leader because they think they're powerful by behaving like jerks. Yeah. So Jason, just to go back to the swoop and poop, how was the, the initial feedback you delivered received? It's important to understand that like the power differential between me and this person was much smaller than the power differential between this person and the team, more broadly speaking. And so I think two things. One, the fact that like I did it in private, I did it, I was very clear, like I gave a very concrete example. It helps the person sort of pause. They had like an initial defensive reaction but I said, like, it's your choice. Like, I can't tell you what to do. But all I can tell you is, like, this is what's happening. It's situation behavior impact. Co correct. And I think by saying, like, like right now, I'm doing my best to advocate. I'm doing my best to help you. But ultimately, it's your choice. And we left that conversation with things unresolved, actually. Like, it wasn't like we had an answer or knew exactly what we were going to do. Things started to change sort of slowly. And, and some of it was, like, you know, as we dug into it a little bit, it was some, a defensive reaction because they were like, well, you know, I kind of wish I was brought in earlier on some of these things. And like, I like, mm -hmm. it seems like a lot of decisions have been made by the time I'm getting a chance to do it. So I have to take a very strong stance. And there was like a back and forth that started to happen. And we started to adjust the process in order to account for that. But I think without like reaching that sort of breaking point and just being super clear about how much harm this behavior is doing, I don't think we would have gotten there. So it was a process. It wasn't like a things were better overnight. I think another thing that has helped me throughout my career sort of manage bosses who are obnoxiously aggressive, and I haven't always done a great job. In fact, I had one boss who was such, he was so belittling to me that I literally, in the course of the year that I worked for him, shrunk half an inch. <laughs> I'm not a tall person. I think I didn't challenge enough. So first of all, I want to say for anybody listening, don't beat yourself up because you're not responding well to the bully. It's really hard. One of the challenges of being around someone who's very obnoxious all the time, it, it, we have instinctual reactions. Like there's sort of like some people have like a fight, flight or freeze kind of reaction to that. And some people internalize that sort of abusive nature as like, there is actually something wrong with me. Like they start criticizing themselves right? and start internalizing that negative message. As a result, they lose their sense of agency, right? They, they lose sight of the fact that they're not terrible. In fact, they're like very employable and they could go like they could go someplace else. And even in the case where that's not an option, I think there are there's work that we can do to work on how much we're going to allow that person's obnoxiousness to affect us, to, Im to impact us. There's work we can do to, to shield ourselves from, from the impact of that. Because I've been in this, a similar situation where I had a manager, a leader who was like very abusive. And I remember it was like Sunday morning at nine o'clock. And I was, there was like a screaming phone call about something that was happening. You know, my job was to make sure that thing didn't happen. And so it was an issue. It wasn't like he was totally wrong, but the way he was approaching me what I realized is like, you need to stop doing this. Like you need to stop. You can't talk to me that way. Like you just can't speak to me that way. I'm going to hang up now and I'm going to go fix the problem. <laughs> and it was like in that moment, that like small bit of agency, right? Like that taking back like the, like I'm not going to accept this abuse in this moment. And I'm not abdicating my responsibility e either. Like I'm accepting that there's something useful here. It unlocked something for me. It, it like changed something in the dynamic of that relationship. It wasn't like I'm leaving the organization tomorrow, but I started to learn how to manage myself and my, emo my emotional reactions in those moments a little bit better. It's also such a good you statement. You can't talk to me like that. I will not listen to you anymore if you keep talking to me that way. But I do believe that we have more agency than we think we do. And realizing that another person cannot make me feel a certain way. I am the only one who has agency over my feelings. I might have a terror response in the moment, yeah. but, but I can manage that response. Well, and I think it's important to distinguish between agency in, in the moment and managing one's own emotions versus a structural situation where you don't feel like if the culture around you is not changing and it's not supporting you, and you might not feel like you're in a position to leave that job for economic reasons. Um, yes. That said, I think it's also important to amplify what 
Jason said, which is that sometimes when you've been in those cultures and you do start to doubt yourself and sort of the impact of gaslighting and all of that, which I've certainly had some experiences like that. And I know some of my colleagues have as well. And so part of it is surrounding yourself with people who actually focus on what you can do and sort of building yourself up and people reminding you of your strengths, because when you're only being shown the negative, it's you start to absorb that. Yes, you do. You do. I mean, I think the ultimate answer to this question is is Viktor Frankl's in Man's Search for Meaning, uh, which which is like you can't choose what happens to you, but you can always choose your response. And and that's where freedom that's where freedom lies, even if you're in the worst of all possible situations, as as Victor. Frank. Absolutely. One of my favorite books of all time. And it helped me at a low moment in my career reading that book. So one other thing I want to add in, in the spirit of like resisting gaslighting, something that I've that I found to be helpful is to seek guidance. So if you really feel like you're up against it with somebody this person, the way they're treating me feels inappropriate. Like where all these interactions feel super stressful. It it can be helpful to like take some time to find, to test your experience and not with the goal of undermining this person, but with the goal of seeking guidance about how better to, how better to address whatever the like problem is that is, that exists in your relationship. One thing that an upstander might be able to do uh, in this situation is if someone comes to you and says like, I'm having this problem with this person is not to try to deliver feedback on their behalf, but often other people are having a very similar experience. You're not alone, but that's the gaslighting part of it can make you feel like you're going crazy. Like everybody else seems to be having a fine time with this and it's just me, but I have found it helpful. And this both as like a person on the receiving end of obnoxious behavior and as the obnoxious person (laughs) to have another person come to me and say, you know, I wanted to share with you this experience (laughs) that I had recently where we had this interaction and it went like this, like, this, and this is this is the impact. This is the negative effect. This is the harm that it caused for me. And that second data point was so powerful for me because it was like some of it, which I had attributed, you know, to the particular relationship with this other person. I started to realize, like, well, actually, no, this is probably something behavioral in me. And they didn't mention each other, but I found out after the fact that they had like talked to each other and they decided to like both come to me with this feedback. Um, and I tell this story in our workshops. It's not something I'm super embarrassed about or anything like that. But like I had a habit of have of having an obnoxious face on uh, while I was listening very closely to people. And it made people feel like I was angry at them all the time. And it colored the way that they sort of interpreted all of the things I was saying about their work. And, and as a result, I seemed very harsh when, in fact, that was not my intent. Like my face and my my mind were just like not in sync not synchronized with one another. Can you make uh, that? Can you make the face? Can we take a little picture? I, of I don't it? think I can do it on Good. demand. On demand. It's just like my brow, my brow really furrows. You're I, thinking. I look it's, like the I'm thi- it's the thinking face. I think it's right. called, I think there might be a gendered version of that resting Jason face is what yes. I think it's called. One of the things I admire you about you, Jason, is your willingness to, to really, at least from my experience, relatively quickly hear feedback, reflect, incorporate on it. I, while I'm, aware that there are moments when you might be more thoughtful. I don't experience it as resting bitch face. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm delighted to say. <laughs> I think you've, I think you took that feedback to heart and he, you've or changed to, your facial expressions. Yeah, which that's is not, oh, like, not easy. Not, not easy. easy at all. Um, I did want to touch base before we close and get into the checklist on something that I think is interesting in terms of our framework, which is about being humble. And if you are, do not have the power and you're dealing with someone acting obnoxiously, humility is not your best friend here. It, it goes with the you statement. So I'm curious when we talk about, you know, it's a similar framework, but where does humility move into actually self-deprecation to actual harm for yourself? Well, I think humility is always actually a good friend. In other words, at least for me, when I'm experiencing someone who's behaving like a jerk, I am very apt to fall prey to the fundamental attribution error and to say, well, this person is acting this way because this person is an asshole. And telling someone the problem here is you are an asshole is not really it's not helpful for them. And it's probably not going to be helpful for me if that person has power over me. So I do think being aware, I think one of the responses to obnoxious behavior when we feel powerless is to call the person names or, or even to shame the person. 
And in theory, if that other person has power, it's their responsibility not to feel shamed and to interpret the feedback properly, but often they don't. And so I think being, being aware when you feel powerless that you're likely to respond to someone who's behaving obnoxious in a way that is obnoxious. As Audre Lorde said, that the master's tools will not dismantle the master's house. So you do actually need to move. We say when someone is yelling at you or, or expressing seriously negative emotions, you, the goal there is you don't want to move off of your challenge directly, but you want to move up a little bit on care personally. And so I think taking a page out of Jason's book and saying, when you do this, it has this impact is a much better way to respond than the fundamental attribution error, which is a natural human response to being in that situation. Jason, did you have any thoughts on humility, arrogance, power, and the fundamental attribution error? The, the thing I want to recognize is that it, it's really hard. The tightrope walk that we're talking about, it's like really, it's really, really hard because in a lot of cases, you know, especially when we get out of just like general behavioral obnoxiousness and into sort of like biased obnoxiousness, right? Like someone making judgments about you because of something that is completely out of your control. I think this like this idea of like how you respond in the moment and what you do, especially focusing on like, is there a way for me to to not meet this person in obnoxious aggression or like retreat from this conversation entirely? I think, you know, just reiterating Kim's point of if you're in that position and you're overwhelmed, like you're not going to respond well. And so retreating into manipulative and sincerity for a while where you're just not protective is self-protective, right? Like we are definitely suggesting that people put their oxygen masks on first, right? Take like you care need of to, yourself. Correct. You need to be in a, a place where you feel like you can engage these things. And hopefully like with uh, my example of like seeking guidance or getting a, a, a colleague or somebody else to approach the same issue, you can also find some allyship or, or upstander friends who can, can help you navigate these things if you can't, if you feel like you can't do it alone. But I do think like focusing on the power we have in, in the moment is really important because it can be very liberating to exercise even a small amount of that power and it can change things. Yeah. Just to, just to realize your response is in your control and also to forgive yourself. It's one of the reasons why I'm reluctant to use the word courageous because sometimes I'm going to respond badly and that doesn't, or I'm just not going to respond because I'm sick of having this conversation or this person has intimidated me in some ways, in some way. And I don't want to condemn myself as being a coward. So I think self, self forgiveness is important as you approach these conversations. So on to our radical canter checklist, specific tips you can put into practice at work and at home and when you're working at home. One of the most important things you can do is if you have power, lay it down. If you don't have power, pick it up. Saying in the spirit of radical candor is not a get out of jail free card. If you're not caring about the person you're talking to, it's obnoxious aggression, not radical candor. Try using a you statement if you are encountering somebody who is approaching you in an, in an obnoxious way, as opposed to focusing on your feelings. And it can be helpful to structure that in a sort of situation behavior impact type of way. When you do this, it has this effect. If you feel like someone is acting obnoxiously with you, focus on the agency that you do have in that moment. And it might mean not making a response. Take care of yourself first. And finally, a word from our sponsor, Kim Scott. This is an ad for The Feedback Loop. Think Groundhog Day meets The Office, a five-episode workplace comedy starring David Allen Greer that brings to life Radical Candor's simple framework for navigating candid conversations. You'll get an hour of hilarious content, and remember, we learn when we laugh, about a team whose feedback fails are costing them business. I just got some feedback from one of the people who took the class and he said it should really be priced at twice what it is, but we're not going to double the price. Instead, we're offering you 10% off the self-paced e-course. Go to radicalcandor.com slash services and enter the promo code feedback at checkout. 
That's RadicalCandor.com slash services, promo code feedback. See you next time. Thanks for joining us. Our podcast features Radical Candor co-founders Kim Scott and Jason Rosoff, is produced by our director of content, Brandy Neal, and hosted by me, Amy Sandler. Music is by Cliff Goldmacher. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at Candor and find us online at RadicalCandor.com. We'll see you soon. Thank you.